good afternoon. Thank you for coming after lunch, and hopefully nobody falls asleep from that lunch lull that everyone experiences. Uh, my name is Chris Kubek. I'm the CEO of Hypasec, and I would like to show you some uh, work that I've been doing recently. This is actually the first time that there will be a full disclosure of some of the work that I've been dealing with with Boeing and Exostar. How many of you fly? <laughs> right? How many of you are curious about the things that I have found regarding Boeing, right? Yeah. How many people don't want to know? <laughs> Excellent. Um, so if it works, well, there's always keys. There we go. A little bit about myself. Uh, my area of expertise is actually cyber warfare and large nation state incident management. Uh, my areas of uh, expertise involved with uh, technology is actually critical infrastructure. So I do a lot with oil and gas, energy, uh, aviation, maritime, and nuclear. Uh, my background was before I set up my company, I was the head of the information protection group for the Aramco family. And under me was the Security Operations Center, Network Operations Center, the Intelligence Apparatus, and the Physical Crisis Management Team. Uh, before that, I started out in the Air Force, and I was uh, both with Space Command and a former military aviator. Since this isn't working, uh, so I come from a background where I know a little bit about aviation and the aviation industry. This was actually the plane that I was a loadmaster on, and my plane was so big that it ate other planes and helicopters, <laughs> right? 998,000 pounds for takeoff for a weight and from ground to the top of the tail, six stories high. It is the largest aircraft in the US military's inventory. And my job was considered the flying calculator, where I had to wait and balance it. And also, I was the ground commander for my aircraft. The pilot is the air commander only whilst it's in the air. So I think we know that there are a lot of challenges when it comes to security, whether application security, physical security, all the cyber-ish things that can uh, fall under that uh, umbrella term. Now, when we're dealing with the aviation industry, we're also dealing with a lot of legacy systems. However, right now, if you are producing aircraft like Boeing, you are actually in the IT industry. You just happen to manufacture airplanes. All of their modern aircraft are what are called E-enabled, and they are gigantic IoT devices. And what that means is, as well, they've got a lot of very, very interesting information that other governments might want to get a hold of. I'll give you a good for instance. A few years ago, uh, Lockheed Martin was making this great jet called the F-35, and suddenly a near exact copy was seen at a Chinese military parade. Yay for China, bad for us. Because that kind of stuff actually costs our US economy billions every year and also costs jobs. <clears throat> so it's uh, extremely important for intellectual property and also classified systems to be kept private with uh, large defense contractors and aircraft manufacturers. Now, at the same time, there are third-party risks. In the case of Lockheed Martin, uh, there was RSA involved. In the case of this Boeing work, there is a company called Exostar, which codes up uh, the majority of the authentication portions of Boeing and Boeing's uh, aviation ID system. Now, some of my motivations came after I read some of the news that was coming out of Boeing after the Ethiopian Airlines crash a year ago. Now, because of my background, I happen to know that Ethiopian Airlines has one of the strongest safety records in the world. And Boeing was initially uh, blaming Ethiopian Airlines, and I thought, something doesn't sound right. And many times, if something doesn't sound right, it might not be correct. We have since learned that uh, even though initially Boeing denied that they had any sort of responsibility with this particular crash or the one with Lion Air uh, from Indonesia, 
Unfortunately, they had some problems with the software that related to a sensor and pulled down that aircraft over and over again, the nose 20 degrees over and over again. And uh, unfortunately, over 300 people have died because of this. I also have experience, fortunately or unfortunately, with uh, in-flight emergencies. I have been in a crash before. I have had to deal with uh, briefing passengers, tying things down so that loose equipment does not fly around when we crash because we had a failure of our primary engines that controlled our hydraulics in my C5. So we could not get the landing gear all the way down. It was stuck halfway up and we were desperately trying to do this because it's better to be all the way up than halfway. Now, I began wondering, could there be any relationship between uh, externally facing uh, software code that I could see on Boeing's infrastructure, and could that also be related to internal bad coding practices? Now, the Aviation ID system is a system where you have an aircraft, you are a technician, you download your flight control software, you load it up on a maintenance laptop, and then you plug that maintenance laptop directly into a plane. Yay! So um, how many of you think that it should be rather secure to get into the Aviation ID system? Yeah, 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 you know. Um, behind the Aviation ID system is also uh, flight control software and software for satellite systems as well. And this flight control software can include classified and unclassified systems. So personally, I would think I would not want a nefarious party to taint that flight control software or otherwise gain that float flight control software, which could lead to uh, possible intellectual property theft by uh, nation state. So as soon as I went to the website, it was last April, I noticed that there was a bit of a comment and I passed it to one of my pilot friends and he laughed and said, well, no, you shouldn't, probably shouldn't extrapolate from the website to flight control software. This was just the HTML page source, by the way. And I saw a lot of things that made me believe that they had rather poor coding practices. Uh, unfortunately, uh, both Exostar and Boeing at the time did not have a vulnerability disclosure program, which I thought was kind of weird, especially since I live in the Netherlands. And Boeing has a holding company in the Netherlands, and because of the size of the funds that they funnel through the Netherlands for a tax break called the Dutch Sandwich, mm -hmm. um, they were actually required to have a vulnerability disclosure program. In the Netherlands, we were the first country in the world to state that companies of a certain size and worth must have a vulnerability disclosure program. So we're kind of unique in that. What the comment said, no idea what this was trying to print, but it only says null. <laughs> right. So uh, this is rather problematic because it could indicate that it they did not understand how to escape special characters. This is on the aviation ID system and the live system. And uh, so I began poking around in a legal manner, I must add, because I am aware of the fact that Boeing is a very high, has a very high threat profile. They've got some juicy juice stuff that a lot of people who might not be very friendly to us sometimes, or we could call them even frenemies, uh, would like to get uh, because of probably my military background, but I think as a general human being, I am always concerned about safety and ensuring that people don't die because of bad coding practices. I was also aware of the fact that because they handled classified systems and were a defense contractor and still are, uh, that there could be national security concerns involved in this if they had poor coding practices. Um, they had uh, unencrypted logins. Uh, uh, in order to get into the aviation ID system, their password complexity was quite frankly a joke. Eight characters, yay! Upper and lower case, maybe. Yes. Um, and in addition to that, for their email systems, uh, you could actually spoof the CEO's email account.
because they had never set up proper security settings and configurations on any of their email systems. Anyone think that that is a fun idea? No. So, even worse, uh, sometimes when I test, I run a browser that does not run JavaScript. So I was looking into the known certificate properties that belong to Boeing using Robtext and census.io, and I happened to see this thing that was basically labeled test aviation ID system.boeing.com. I was like, that can't be online. Yes, it was online. And bonus was when I went and visited the page without running JavaScript, all it said was, you are not running JavaScript, press this button, press the button, it let me in to the R&D section of the flight control software for Boeing. Now, um, being as I used to uh, head security operations uh, centers, uh, one of the things that we almost never did, if ever, was for test and development servers, we did not monitor those for security. The reason being is there's all sorts of changes going on and testing going on, and I would not want my people to be running around chasing a false uh, piece of information and diverting from the real stuff. Uh, in addition to that, a lot of the uh, test systems like this for development, what happens is they might be using real data they might be using slightly aged data, but most likely they are also connected to internal systems. So here was this entire system exposed where an attacker could pivot into it from the internet without any security monitoring whatsoever. And if you are a naughty nation state and you want to make sure that you keep what is called persistence inside your target, you know what's going on on those test servers. It gives you a glimpse into the future so that you can alter your code to ensure the persistence inside that particular target. So I saw that this was extremely problematic for obvious reasons, right? Um, they had almost no web pages that actually used any sort of encryption whatsoever. And I want to repeat that. Even on login pages for sensitive information, there was basically no encryption used on any of the Boeing.com or Boeing-owned domains at all. Uh, in addition to that, they had hard-coded credentials in an old version of SAML on some of their websites. That is part of the OWASP top 10. You do not hard-code credentials in anything. And the version of SAML that they were running, you could ju then just go on a website to decode it and see the credentials. This is highly problematic because if they had such lackadaisical uh, security already, how many systems internally and externally were also using those same hard-coded credentials that you could decode? Now, I am one person, and Boeing, unfortunately, in the news recently has come out that they have not been too kind to individuals either working inside their company or externally when they try to report various items, whether that be safety issues or what have you. A couple of days ago, the news broke that in 2009, the Dutch government was pressured by Boeing and friends from the US authorities to not report on safety issues dealing with sensors on a version of the 737, which that sensor was later used basically for the 737 MAX. I happen to be at that crash site at Schiphol in Amsterdam, where I worked at the time. It was at the alternate runway at that building, and that aircraft could have killed me. And unfortunately, because those events were not reported, uh, it could very well have led to the crashes at Lion Air and Ethiopian Airlines. Uh, in addition to that, I have to be very aware that I am a security researcher. And sometimes when you tell a corporation that's big with a huge legal team and a PR apparatus that their baby is ugly, they will sue the living bejesus out of you, right? Or what if they got a sympathetic prosecutor to try to charge you for computer crimes? Now, um, 
A benefit of living in the Netherlands is we have very, very strong security researcher protection laws that if we follow the law and we disclose in a secure manner, that we cannot be sued in any way, shape, or form for that or prosecuted. In addition to that, any of these types of lawsuits are considered censorship, and censorship is very much illegal in the Netherlands. Uh, unfortunately, there was a previous researcher who had uh, gotten into the R&D section of the flight control software for Boeing in uh, 2018, late 2017. That security researcher will not speak about the event again. I have been told that there were lots of different techniques that were used to keep that particular researcher quiet. Uh, the BBC has also reported that even internal employees, one in particular, uh, tried to report safety issues that only 25% of the oxygen masks would deploy on uh, the 787 Dreamliner that he was blackmailed into basically retiring early. He now has a lawsuit against Boeing. So there were a lot of issues with uh, me reporting this. I was then told internally, well, not internally, but by various parties, and it was a paraphrase that basically uh, any security researcher who disclosed any vulnerabilities about Boeing, we would turn our entire legal and PR apparatus against them and ruin their reputation. This is not what a security researcher wants to hear, and quite frankly, when lives are at risk, this should not be the situation for any security researcher uh, trying to disclose major issues for a defense contractor. Uh, a very good example of how insecure Boeing was, this was their website. Not secure, no encryption, Boeing.com. Not very good at all. In addition to that, Boeing sells cybersecurity services to parts of the U.S. government. Their website for selling cybersecurity services to the U.S. government and other parties also was not encrypted. Oh, so secure. <clears throat> in addition to that, there has been a history of Boeing having various malware infections and denying it and then being caught out for it over the years, which unfortunately makes uh, Boeing a bit less trustworthy when you happen to find uh, possible indicators of compromise involving malware that could be coming out of their email servers. And these are some of the things that I found. Uh, I did tell them, hey, I, if we can spoof your CEO's email, we can spoof anything because of the particular settings. Uh, they also had remote management protocols that they were using that were weak or outdated um, and for best practices should not have been used at all. And they had a third party which was doing a lot of the coding for the aviation ID portion. And in many cases, companies, when they hire these third parties, they don't typically have the knowledge to put in their contracts, hey, you have to keep things updated. Here's your contractual obligations. If we find a vulnerability, you've got a certain time frame. A lot of secure uh, software development lifecycle issues are not written into those contracts, and procurement doesn't think about them. And this is just a very unfortunate thing. But we are in the modern digital world, and we have to think about this kind of stuff more and more. So some of the malware issues I found that I put in the report were there were several email servers that were infected with various forms of malware. That means that uh, there were assets behind that email server that were communicating all over the place. Calling home, there were documents associated with it. Some of those documents, one was uh, 787max and then a couple of characters, .pdf. So that in particular case, it was uh, targeted last year. And uh, some of the uh, malware that was coming out was not, say, your typical malware. Uh, it did not have a lot of antivirus engines that detected it. Of the 21 that did detect it at the time, they were kind of oddball ones and not the major ones. And that is unusual because if it was just a generalized infection, you would uh, expect Symantec or McAfee or so forth to be able to identify these things. But if it was a more targeted, sophisticated attack, then you would expect more of a result like this. 
<clears throat> now, when I was at Hacker Summer Camp in Las Vegas over the summer at the B-Size DEF CON Black Hat area, I was giving a talk, Hack the World with Open Source Intelligence Gathering at the DEF CON ICS Village. Um, some of the things I was talking about was the aviation industry and some airports I could get into and things of that nature. And Boeing became very concerned. And what had happened was before my talk, I sent out a tweet because I'd been trying to get in touch with Boeing since April of last year. And I go, hey, does anybody know Boeing? I've just found my sixth cross-site scripting vulnerability on the aviation ID system. I was immediately contacted by the US Aviation ISAC, a member of that organization, and asked to write a report. I then was immediately contacted by someone from the United Kingdom telling me, do not work with them. We are putting you in touch with the Department of Homeland Security ICS search, but do not work with them. And I was pondering why, and this is when I started getting the information that they were threatening security researchers for disclosing anything. I was then placed in contact with Department of uh, Homeland Security ICS CERT. They asked me to send the report only to them. I then told the aviation ISAC here in the United States that I would not be sharing the report, and a report would be coming out of the US government, and I was doing coordinated disclosure with the United States. At the same time, Exostar, the coders of the Aviation ID system, sent me a very odd email, which basically sounded like it was written by a lawyer. I had a lawyer friend check it out. Oh yeah, this was written by a lawyer, uh, even though it was supposed to be a security manager. And I highlighted to Exostar that the way that the email was written, because uh, this person also detailed tweets and podcasts and things that I had been in, that it appeared to me very much like it was the EFF's description of a chilling effect. I also added that all research took place in accordance with Dutch laws and that censorship is illegal, that I would be coordinating disclosure with the Department of Homeland Security only, and that Boeing and the US Aviation ISAC had been notified that this was the situation. In addition to that, the Department of Homeland Security requested I make them aware of any person or company trying to threaten in a litigious manner, bully or censor me regarding the report. I sincerely hope this was not your lawyer's intention. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. So the next morning, I had an employee from the US Aviation ISAC come to my hotel. Now this employee happened to tell me I happen to be a Boeing employee also operating the Aviation ISAC. This was the reason why I was told not to work with the Aviation ISAC for this particular disclosure because it would have never actually been disclosed beyond this and there was a high probability that nothing would have ever been fixed. Now, after this person, who was very nice, uh, came to my hotel, he tried to get me to sign a non-disclosure agreement. There was later a news article which uh, the Aviation ISAC disputed the claim uh, and said that they met in a coffee shop. Now this happened to be my Dutch time for meeting with this person where I was staying at the Platinum Hotel and Spa and that was the hotel that I was staying in. I most definitely had this person come to my hotel, not at a coffee shop. My hotel, that hotel has no coffee shop. It's not even a casino hotel, it is a very small hotel. So uh, they actually um, were not, let's say, um, <clears throat> as truthful as they should have been to the news media about the situation because they did not want the perception that they were threatening me in any way, shape, or form. How many of you would feel comfortable with a Boeing employee who also is in the US Aviation ISAC coming to your hotel? Since I am a singular person, and I do not have the legal budget to fight Boeing, if you were in my position, would you feel threatened? Especially if you knew that other researchers had already been threatened. So I sent them a 59-page report. Eventually, they came back with answers. I kind of generalized this to shorten it for a slide. Uh, they insisted that uh, they did not have any sort of email infection, that they had called out their incident response team, and there was no evidence. 
In addition to that, uh, they said that they were finally going to start deploying something called DMARC on their email servers so that nobody could spoof the Boeing.com domain and spoof the CEO's email address. So they were going to be deploying, no timeline set. For the credentials, they said, yes, we understand it's possible to disclose. However, we're meeting that NIST guideline standard. So it's OK. Yay! Uh, exposed development systems. They uh, mentioned uh, the email. Then they also said that it is performing as intended. That is not the response that you want to get, performing as intended wide open. Uh, for uh, various remote management protocols, they were planning an upgrade. And for the password complexity, uh, they were, again, trying to develop a stronger password policy. So for the report feedback, what is your opinion? Do you think it was good? Right? Or do you think it was more like this? Um, now, unfortunately, after that report feedback, uh, they hadn't really changed anything. And a journalist checked their uh, encryption certificates, DMARC settings, and so forth a month after their report feedback and found that they hadn't really done anything. Uh, and this was very, very unfortunate uh, because one of the main concerns was the malware that was involved with their email system and the fact that it looked extremely targeted. Now, part of my background, I've been dealing with malware. I belong to VirusTotal, just as an example, for 11 years. I do malware analysis as well. I love to get my hands dirty in all the wrong ways sometimes. Now, most recently, I've been working further. The Department of Homeland Security asked me to take a cursor review again at Boeing to see if they were changing anything. And one of the things I found looking uh, through a tool called Looking Glass Scout Prime, I was given a demonstration for free. The first thing I did was look up Boeing and started to see that there were still some issues with their email system. Now, unfortunately, one of the challenges is the fact that Boeing has not been very transparent and has denied previous malware infections in the past when they have been caught out with them indeed having active malware infections. And one of the only ways really to prove uh, that there is absolutely a malware infection is to have access to their systems or to have access to the command and control servers that that malware is calling to. And in particular, I've been dealing with something where one of these is in the country of Russia, as far as we can tell. And the cert that I'm working with in Asia has no jurisdiction, and neither does the cert in the Netherlands. So it is very difficult to prove. Now, in addition to that, it got a bit more complicated. I was asked by someone who shall remain anonymous, who works for the Dutch government, to contact the FBI to see if they would open an investigation against Boeing for coercion. And this most likely is related to the 2009 Turkish Airways crash that occurred at Schiphol Airport. Uh, in addition to that, <clears throat> try not to cough in the mic. In 2017, the Securities and Exchange Commission gave guidance that uh, companies who are publicly traded must represent cybersecurity risks so that their shareholders know what the true value is uh, and if they're going to lose money because their IP is just going to go away. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, they also uh, had an undisclosed uh, breach in 2017 in their R&D section, which they had not disclosed to the SEC. I spoke with the SEC legal team, and we are in discussions for providing me whistleblower protections with the Securities and Exchange Commission. In addition to that, after the story first broke about my involvement with Boeing, uh, multiple parties uh, started whistleblowing to me to describe things. This is actually the timeline of one of the breaches in their R&D section. That was the same R&D section I was able to get into for the test aviation ID system. They had not fixed anything. Their response to a black hat talk from this particular security researcher 
who I will leave his name out because uh, he will not talk to anyone about it. Um, <clears throat> they briefed all of the airlines and aircraft owners and leasees that all of their aircraft met the cybersecurity, uh, software security consistent with uh, particular uh, guidance and um, requirements. Now, with that letter, they also included every single aircraft that they had ever manufactured, including the Douglas line. We're talking about 40 and 50 year old aircraft. None of these are E enabled. It didn't make much sense. Journalist is trying to use a FOA request to get this, but he does not have uh, a lot of faith in the system and basically has told me it could take many, many years to get this document. And when I talk about coercion and things of this nature, this was a message involving someone who was speaking to me about the fact that their team was blacklisted because uh, they saw additional issues with Boeing. And uh, unfortunately, they now do something completely different. Now, when Department of Homeland Security asked me to look at their infrastructure again, I found unencrypted with no authentication, the Boeing in the plane cabin viewing system for their cameras. Great idea, right? No. Unfortunately, uh, this was the case. Uh, Boeing has been um, not the quickest at correcting uh, multiple issues. Now, they have had some uh, improvement, some. Uh, based on my 59-page report, uh, they actually opened their very first vulnerability disclosure program. That's a good thing. The PGP key that they used, it didn't actually work because it was just random characters. And in order to disclose things securely, because you don't want everybody knowing these things, you need to use some sort of encryption. And they had just put a dummy key that didn't work for their vulnerability disclosure program. As far as I'm aware, they have not corrected that. Uh, finally, October 29th of 2019, uh, they actually installed a uh, encryption certificate on Boeing.com. Mind you, this was reported in July. Uh, while uh, I was about to give a talk at an aviation conference to discuss some of this, a shortened talk about it. Uh, they then contacted the media organization that was going to do a very small story about it. And Boeing's uh, legal team contacted uh, the media organization's legal team, as well as the journalist's editor and senior editor, which is not a good move, uh, because that's like calling your boss and your boss's boss and it was perceived as could this be censorship or pressure on the journalist. In addition to that, uh, Boeing's uh, legal team then contacted the Department of Homeland Security ICS CERT to talk to them as well. I'm not sure why legal to legal team had to be involved, but it sounded and seemed a bit uh, kind of basically creepy. Um, then there were a couple of uh, like bot attacks against the journalist's uh, Twitter account after uh, the story broke, and that lasted for about a week and a half. And unfortunately, Exostar, the uh, coders for the authentication portion for the aviation ID, uh, still do not have any vulnerability disclosure program at all. Now, <clears throat> we talk a lot about application security, but what can we do about it even in the aviation uh, area. And the problem is they use software. Everybody's using software. Things are internet connected, sometimes all the time, sometimes not. When you have a, an E-enabled plane nowadays, uh, there are certain security things that occur on that aircraft. And what happens is when that aircraft parks up to a trusted location, a trusted airport, uh, all the data from that plane is then downloaded. And you hope that the airport infrastructure that is being used uh, is actually secure. But at the same time, a maintenance laptop is then plugged into that airplane. A different aircraft manufacturer that I will not mention, uh, they have already experienced, but yet have not gone public with it, the fact that they have had several technician maintenance laptops which have been infected by malware, 
plugged into a plane and they have no method of cleaning the bad code off of the plane even though it is not meant for that operating system. Now we do have solutions. Um, obviously, I don't think I'm a criminal. Uh, during part of this, uh, they asked what my motivations were and they tried to infer that I might be extorting them for money. My response to that was I sent them a picture of the National Security Director, General Nakasone. I took at a conference uh, last April, it's a closed conference called the Joint Services Academy Cybersecurity Summit. And I said, basically, here's a picture, the NSA director, if you want, I could probably get you an autograph. <laughs> um, so that can um, harm the relationship between a security researcher trying to infer certain things like that and really get your back up. It certainly got mine. Um, one of the joys of doing some of these things is I was not out to use destructive tools or anything like that. It's publicly available information, things that were openly exposed. I did not use any exploits. Nothing like that was involved in any of this. Uh, in addition to this, we have stakeholders that involve shareholders, the company, and every single person in this room that fly on an aircraft. And I certainly would want to know that the aircraft that I was flying on didn't have software vulnerabilities. Boeing and Airbus, for example, have been asked to list all the open source libraries that they currently use on their aircraft, and they are unable to do so. Who, who, who's flying back home? Um, one of the problems with the Boeing issue is there has been a loss of trust when it comes to this company. And this is very, very unfortunate because it's almost as if they took a page every time from the playbook that said um, how to make all the wrong moves. And Boeing is a major manufacturer in the United States because of some of this loss of trust with Boeing, uh, aircraft orders are now going to Airbus. There have been at least 7,500 jobs lost in the aviation industry since this has been happening. Boeing is responsible for more than just manufacturing an aircraft, but the entire ecosystem that surrounds it. And the last thing the U.S. economy needs is for the majority of these large jets to be manufactured over to Europe. Europe? We love it, but it's not so good for the US economy. Uh, they also have to, or will need to do a lot to improve their public perception, because right now it's not very good at all. It's almost as if every week something more comes out in the news that makes us doubt Boeing's intentions. Um, obviously, me doing this, I work directly with the U.S. government. Uh, my main motivations was to ensure that a criminal or a nation state did not misuse this. I do not think that the U.S. economy needs to suffer billions and billions more for intellectual property theft because it costs us all in the long run. And it's something I just don't agree with. These types of things need to be made routine. Major companies like this must have a vulnerability disclosure program that works. And right now, there is no law that says in the United States that this is required. But in the Netherlands, it is. So to close off, because I tried to leave uh, plenty of time for questioning, I wanted to give a shout out to the journalists, to the ICS search, to Looking Glass Cyber, and the BBC, I've also been working with them. Uh, they may or may not be uh, doing a documentary on some of the Boeing things, which I will be part of. So thank you very much, everyone. I'll take questions. <laughs> She's been keeping her, her arm up for, for ages. Where is the FAA on this? Well, the FAA, uh, unfortunately, even though there are certain cybersecurity guidelines now, uh, for aircraft, uh, they basically have said that uh, they are not responsible so much for it. Exactly. It's, it's exasperating. Well, uh, that's part of what uh, DHS ICS CERT did, and that's why they wanted me to coordinate with them, because they were afraid that if it went to the U.S. Aviation ISAC, that it would have just disappeared. 
So uh, it was due to their involvement that uh, Boeing actually had to really start getting things fixed and the, the fact that a media organization covered it, that it became public and then they finally, after there was like a, a webcast and the news came out, uh, they finally, a couple of weeks later, started even using an email, uh, excuse me, an encryption certificate on Boeing.com. So, although I've not been able to procure it, I have been told by several parties that the 787 Dreamliner, a little bit over 10 years ago, had a penetration test involving their Wi-Fi, which part of their electrical system runs over to save on weight, and I was told that uh, they failed miserably. Uh, Boeing had tried to get the report changed and the engineer said no. So suddenly the report got mothballed. We are trying to get a copy of that report. I have spoken to one particular individual who helped write that report, um, but can't get a hold of it. So I hope that answers your question. I have one here. Well, no, I notified the Dutch authorities who uh, now the Dutch prosecutor office uh, also is aware of the fact that they have now placed themselves in a position for being fined by the Dutch government because they did not have it. So the Dutch, that information is with the Dutch government at this point in time. And part of the reason why the Dutch government is also protecting me over in the Netherlands is the fact that they did not follow the laws of the Netherlands. Uh, as the law is written, as long as you follow the law, uh, you are protected automatically. A corporation can't just sue you because it is considered censors censorship. Only a Dutch prosecutor can sue you for something like that, and it would be a criminal matter. Let me rephrase. I mean, if, if you're American researchers and we work through a tough thing, <laughs> that help protect us? Um, it could do. I am not a lawyer. I know, I know. But it could do. That is a possibility, yes. Maybe. Maybe I should set that up as a business. <laughs> yes. Well, I will tell you this much. Uh, I've been to several um, ICS uh, security conferences where other aircraft manufacturers have been there. Airbus has given presentations on when they have been breached, even on their production line. I have seen Lockheed Martin in my workshops at those particular conferences. I have never seen Boeing attend. So it's just a bit unfortunate. I still have some time. There's got to be more. Can't be just this guy in the blue shirt or this guy in the blue shirt. A guy in a blue shirt. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, it's just a bit slow moving. You have to deal at the federal level, then you have to deal with the state level, the local level, and so forth. And uh, there are some people talking about this uh, in Washington and various circles. However, getting the traction for it and getting uh, various companies that participate in lobby groups that are quite powerful to agree to it is very difficult. Security-wise, uh, it should not have taken since last July, right? Uh, because, uh, like this gentleman in the blue shirt mentioned, that some of these sayings were kind of basic and rather kind of easy to change. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think that the company culture from the top is one of the things that uh, does not really uh, make it conducive for a lot of changes. And this is very unfortunate uh, with Boeing. Uh, the CEO uh, did step down, but that did not include any other members of the executive board. So one person left, the rest are still there. And so that most likely will mean that that company culture will still exist. I used to uh, lecture for Centers for the Protection of National Infrastructure for the United Kingdom, and I've worked with uh, major utility uh, companies, uh, nuclear uh, water, public transport, and so forth. And what I did was I would speak with the, both the management and also the engineers themselves because I do a lot of things in ICS SCADA systems and the protocols involved with them. So yes, I have. And some of them are great. Some of them, ah, um, and that's just the way it is kind of around the world because the majority of critical infrastructure uh, is privately owned, so there is only so much regulation that you can mandate in certain circumstances unless it's a nuclear facility.
I've got just a little bit more time, about two minutes. Two minutes. Any more questions? <laughs> um, I think as long as that cult cultural change involved a focus on availability, uh, which is very different from the IT world where confidentiality is king, availability and integrity are uh, paramount when it comes to industrial and control systems of this manner. So I think if it was phrased properly, uh, then they would be open to change because they are much more focused on safety. They are much more focused. These are engineers and people associated with process engineering and control engineering. And that is one of their primary focuses. So I do think that they would be. After speaking to multiple critical infrastructure engineers and process engineers and operators, uh, they are open to change when uh, there is a focus of availability, which also can affect uh, safety and security, but human life is paramount to them. So yes. I have about 30 seconds. Going once. How did you meet the general? How did I meet the general? Well, I have this uh, friend who uh, set up this uh, particular conference, uh, the Joint Services Academy Cybersecurity Summit, which is held at various military academies. And last year happened to be uh, at the Air Force Academy. And that uh, nice gentleman who uh, I will be uh, attending again this year uh, because of him is sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, yes. All right, I am out of time. Uh, so to leave time enough for the next speaker to come up and set up, thank you very much for listening, and have a great day. Thank you.